Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Chris Grinzig. Thanks for being on the show, Chris. Yeah, thanks for having me. Chris bought a house flipping course, but failed in the house flipping business. Thought about buying tax auctions in, in Philly, but instead JV'd on an eight unit in Cincinnati. He, since, he syndicated 17 units in Cincinnati and an 82 unit in Jacksonville. Then he joined Turo Real Estate Partners in August 2016 and has helped close over 2,300 units valued over $145 million with another 812 units worth over $60 million set to close in one to two months. Well, that's impressive, Chris. Uh, Chris, why don't you give us a little more of your background and you know how you got in the syndication business? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so back about three, four years ago, uh, I was actually working as a, a stockbroker in New York. And at the time when I first got into it, I didn't know the whole business and a lot of the, the stigma attached to it. And it was funny when I was doing it, the, the Wolf of Wall Street kind of came out at the time and it was changed a lot since then, but it's a lot of the similarities. It's a very much a culture I didn't enjoy. So while I was working there, I started looking for some different avenues to kind of get out of. And my mom and my cousin were looking to get into the flipping, uh, you know, single family house and stuff like that. And they found a course that they really liked. So they kind of dragged me along by my, uh, you know, kicking and screaming a little bit to try to get me out there. And we did a, like a three day seminar or something. And I was hooked from there. It was something I really enjoyed. I really wanted to be a part of it. I thought it was very interesting. I really didn't have any real estate knowledge. So it was something I was really learning as quick and as fast as I could. And, you know, from there as you know, most of my weekends were, you know, trying to learn all the, you know, the rules and stuff around flipping and how to make it work. And, you know, going out there and looking at really beat up rundown houses and, uh, trying to make it work from there. And when we bought the course, you know, I know you mentioned that, you know, we failed, we, we were trying to go out there and flip these deals on, you know, the MLS and try to find deals and just kind of make it work. And it was something that I think taught me a lot while I was doing it. And it was actually worth it in the end, even though we lost a good chunk of change, it, it actually it was worth its weight in gold because it led me into the different networking stuff and kind of pivoting and, you know, getting my feet in the water from that standpoint where, yeah, we never flipped the deal on Long Island, which is where I'm from, but we've actually done, you know, a few others in other areas where we partnered with some other people. Um, you know, I learned about tax auctions and tax deeds and stuff down in Philly, which we tried to do. And then, you know, it eventually led me, you know, over into the multifamily space where I met a lot of good people. You know, I ended up working for a company I really like and, you know, ended up being able to do some syndication on my own on the side. Nice. Nice. So, you know, how, how quickly did you move from the flipping into that first syndication? How, tell us about that, you know, that transition. Yeah. So we probably tried it for a good six to eight months to really try to make it work. It wasn't like, it was really, you know, I kind of wish we would have stuck to it a little bit longer and, you know, tried a little bit harder because when I look back on it now, you know, at the time I, I blamed a couple of different, you know, outside factors and, you know, didn't really take any as much responsibility as I probably do now where I think we probably could have made it work if we did a little bit more, you know, direct mailing or direct owners or, you know, drive for dollars and kind of that stuff where, you know, we just kind of looked on them less. And, you know, my cousin has a real estate license and we were just trying to make it work that way. You know, I think we could have made it work. I think it just would have taken a little bit more stomach, a little bit longer, you know, trying to stick it out a little bit, but we tried for a good six to eight months. And then we met uh, John Cohen, who you had on the show and who's actually I work for now. And he was moving from, the, the tax auctions and tax deeds in Philly over to the multifamily side. He had done a few on his own, a few smaller ones. And it was right around the time Toro was actually had just formed or was forming back in like 2015, give or take. And he was like, Hey, I'm moving out of the space. Why don't you guys try and move in and you can buy these tax auctions and flip them. So me and my cousin, we drove down to Philly and anybody who's ever done tax auctions in Philly is the way it works. So they put out like a list of like, two, 300 properties. And if you want, you can go bid on them blind or you can go drive around beforehand. So we quickly found out which were the worst of the worst areas and tried to avoid them. But you know, all these things are in pretty rough areas and wasn't really something that we enjoyed doing. 
it wasn't, you know, the reason we got into real estate and flipping was you know, we got sold on the whole thing, uh, you know, no money down, have somebody else swing hammers and the whole nines. And this was, all right, now we're going to go get our hands dirty and, you know, go down into Philly and, you know, all this other stuff. And my cousin at the time just had a newborn as well, or recently born, I forget exactly what the timing was. So it was just a lot of time away that we weren't as excited about as we were when we first got into it. So, you know, try the flipping, took a while to realize we didn't like it, try the tax auctions, realized very quickly we didn't like it. And then we were looking for, all right, what, what's our niche? Where are we going to kind of find our home in real estate? And when we came back, had a meeting with John again, and he had an eight unit he was raising money for. And he was like, look, I know you guys are trying to do your own thing. Is this any interest to you? And we were like, yes, absolutely. But we have one caveat. And that was, can we just ask you as many questions as possible to see if we like it and we want to get into it? And I'm sure in his head, He's like, yeah, sure, whatever. We'll get coffee once or twice, and you guys will ask you questions. That'll be it. That'll be done. And it ended up me being pestering him for about, you know, two, three months, asking him a bunch of questions. And it kind of led to the point where I was looking to leave my job. They were looking to bring someone in. We had actually partnered on another 17 unit while I was there, and we were looking to partner on an 82 unit in Jacksonville. And he was like, look, we're trying to bring someone in. I know you want to leave. Do you want a job? And I was like, yes. So it was probably from when we first got involved to when I moved over full time as, you know, into Toro and doing, you know, really full time, probably a good year and a half from, you know, the first day of flipping to the first syndication deal, probably about eight or nine months, give or take. Nice. So I really like how, you know, you, you were able to, I guess, provide value, some kind of value to John, you know, you did you bring capital to a deal? Is that what you said? So the the first one, yeah, put some money into myself. Okay. Had been saving money up while I was working and stuff like that. And then, you know, the next one, it was, you know, working on raising money for the other one. Uh, then same thing for the one in Jacksonville. Also put some money into it, but also helped raise money, find the deal, you know, all that stuff. And it was just kind of like, as that was happening, you know, kind of all the, you know, the, the Toro stuff happened as well. So it's kind of like when I talk to people about it, it's sometimes a little bit confusing because the lines get blurred a little bit and it's not always clear. So it takes a little bit of explaining, but uh, it kind of operated in two separate worlds a little bit, but ended up kind of merging together. And since I've come over, I just spent so much time on some of the bigger stuff. I haven't really done anything myself personally, but I'm basically doing the same stuff I would be doing on my own, just with a, you know, kind of a little bit of a, a backstop and a little bit of, of a bigger target. That's great. You know, a lot of people ask about how to get into this, into this industry or into the space. And, and it sounds like, you know, you, you were already, you know, you were pursuing real estate and you, you were gaining some education there. And then, uh, you know, you built a relationship with John, obviously, you know, and he was, um, you know, he, he needed somebody else in the office or was ready to hire somebody. And, and you already had that relationship built and, and, and then was able to provide a little value also. And so, uh, but yeah, that's great. So then you got to ask all the questions that you wanted. So why don't we talk about like the, let's say the 82 unit in Jacksonville. Why don't you mm-hmm. walk us through that, through that deal a little bit? Yeah. So that was actually even a little bit more complicated finding the deal because while, you know, we were working on some of the other stuff and I wasn't quite working there, uh, we started helping out with some of the the meetups that we were doing. So we, we have been doing and still do. Uh, free meetup every month and we kind of just center it around a different topic or a talking point or we'll bring like where's the meetup at uh it's in westbury new york on long island uh, our next one's actually on december 13th on thursday uh so while we were doing that what we wanted to do was kind of do what we had done and do it with other people so we actually had for the 17 units that we did in it's actually covington kentucky it's right outside cincinnati it's like if you think about brooklyn to manhattan Covington is the Brooklyn of Cincinnati kind of it's across the water a little bit different a little bit smaller but obviously not quite Manhattan and Brooklyn uh and what we were able to do was we said to three people we said you know we know you want to get into the space you want to start buying stuff you know invest with us and we'll sit down with you once a week same type of thing you know we're not taking twenty thousand dollars for a coaching course that's not what we want but it was a it was a it was a business within a business we were trying out to see if we liked and if it would work and, you know, we, we did it, we liked it, but it wasn't something we really wanted to build out. So we kind of just stopped it after that. But it actually led to one of the guys finding this deal in Jacksonville that we bought and brought it to us to partner with. So it was, uh, you know, the 
the guy who was learning from us, uh, myself, my mom, my cousin, and John all partnered on this deal of uh, different splits for different things. And, you know, we were able to come in, raise the money from some private guys, people we knew from the meetup and stuff like that. And then we actually also went out and raised the money with Realty Shares, which is a crowdfunding website. Nice. So, nice. yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting from that standpoint. Uh, the deal itself, the, the reason we really liked it was the manager that we know and have used in the past in Jacksonville, she was already managing the deal for the current owners. So it was an easy transition. It was, you know, found the deal, saw she was managing, called her up and said, should we buy this? And she said, yes. And then we went from there, obviously. It's, it still made financial sense and it's probably one of our better performing deals just because we bought it right and we knew how it was going to operate because it was the same manager. The only thing that really changed was taxes. And it was just a ton of upside on it. You know, the, the past owners came in and bought it. I mean, I see pictures and it was in pretty rough shape and they actually did a really good job coming in and cleaning up and executing on their business plan and, you know, left a tremendous amount of meat on the bones for us. And it's probably something that, you know, we're still going to be able to continue to increase, you know, rent and income and, you know, still leave some meat on the bones for the, for the next guy. What kind of upside, what, what will you all be changing doing to the property to create this upside? Yeah. So we came in and, you know, we did some, you know, more cosmetic stuff. They did a lot with like roofs, HVACs, parking lots, stuff like that, where we came in and, you know, they had put up fences where we came in and we stained them a nice dark color. We came in and we finished putting in uh, these black solar screens, which tied in well, because there's a lot of black, like outlining in the property. It's tough to explain if you don't see it, but it looked a lot nicer. And it also covers up uh, the really bad blinds that people break. It kind of hides that as well, which is nice when you're driving through. Uh, Came and did new pool furniture. Uh, What else did we do? A couple other exterior things like some curbs, some signage, some landscaping, just minor stuff like that. And then we did a lot of interior upgrades. They had, you know, just really, really old cabinets, flooring, appliances, stuff like that. So they had done a handful of kind of like a minor upgrade where they put in some some vinyl rollouts, some black appliances. They painted some cabinets. And what we were going to do is come in and do uh, the, the plank, because it's a little bit easier to maintain. Uh, new appliances, epoxy the cabinets, new hardware, uh, new bathroom vanities, new bathroom mirrors, resurface the counter, resurface tubs, and just kind of spend like three to 3,500 per unit, you know, push rents 100, 125 bucks, nothing crazy, and just kind of go from there. But one of the things that's been really interesting is one, the growth in Jacksonville has been incredible the past year. I mean, we're 90, six percent occupied and you know we have a waiting list on one bedrooms which is crazy and two is our manager is actually able to su- secure a deal with a local supplier for brand new cabinet brand new countertops for about 1900 bucks installed and it only brought up our cost about a thousand bucks per unit we were able to get another 50 75 bucks for that so it really changed what we were doing at the property and has really helped us be able to push rents even further than we thought we were going to be able to Nice. So tell us something else about this, about this deal that y'all liked. Maybe uh, go into about the location a little deeper about Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Jacksonville, fun fact, actually the largest landmass of any U.S. city in the country. Uh, Back in like the early 2000s, Duval County and the city of Jacksonville actually combined the, basically combined and they're the same. So it's actually the most amount of land of any U.S. city. So it's always a fun fact. If you ever talk to somebody from Jacksonville, especially in real estate, they always throw that in your face right right when you start talking to them about it. So always got to throw that out there. But this is on the west side of Jacksonville, but it's really – the west side is probably one of the not nicer areas. There's really nice pockets in it. Uh, one of them is called Ortega, and ours is right just south of Ortega. and then But just south of the west side, which is technically not in the city limits, is an area called Orange Park, Florida, which is a real – B, B class area with some really nice properties. And we're just, just south of Ortega and just north of Orange Park. So we get a lot of benefits of both. And we were able to get it at a discount where you have the people that can't quite live in Orange Park and the people that can't quite live in Ortega, but they want a nice place. And they were able to come to us and kind of get, you know, maybe not the nicest looking property from the exterior and doesn't have all the, you know, the, the lights and flashiness and all that stuff, but it's just a good place to live, big apartments being renovated and, you know, pretty, you know, solid workforce housing option for a lot of people. So do you know, it's it's in a nice middle ground. Do you know about, you know, the structure of this deal, how it was structured? And could you explain that to us? 
in terms of just like the you know how much capital raise and how you know how it was structured with investors yeah sure so it was uh just over $3.8 million. We came in and we got from Freddie small balance. We got 80% loan to value. Uh, it was actually really nice when we first got the property, it was like right around a six cap on trailing 12. And then the last two, three, four months, there was a real big uptick in income as they were kind of finishing up their plan and putting all the last pieces into place. And by the time we closed, it was like a six and a half, six and three quarter cap you know, before tax adjustment. So it was really nice going in. We had a really nice Delta on, you know, what we were borrowing money at and what our in-place cap rate was. So we came in with really good cash flow coming in. And then on top of that, you know, we brought about $350,000 in CapEx to spend on, you know, a lot of the exterior stuff I said about a couple little deferred maintenance items. They had some problems with like some drainage. So we installed some French drains. Uh, we brought in some new soil to kind of help, get some stuff out. There's actually uh, a ditch around the exterior of the property behind the fencing where the water trails off to. So we actually dug that about a foot deeper and a foot wider uh, and kind of cleared out a lot of like dead trees and trash and stuff like that to kind of just help with the water off of the property. Cause there's some standing water when it rained pretty heavily and it rains a lot in Jacksonville. So, you know, we cleaned up some minor stuff like that, but a bulk of the capital has been towards interior renovations. And our plan was to kind of come in and do, I think, of the 80, we were going to do about 45 of the units, give or take, uh, doing the old upgrade plan. But now we're spending a little bit more, but we're getting more on rent. So we're probably going to be doing a little bit less, you know, probably in the upper 30s range, give or take, uh, just because the price has gone up, but we're getting more. So we'll probably renovate, call it, call it 40 units, give or take. And, you know, we'll kind of just continue to push rent as much as we can, cash flow, and then, you know, look for an exit in, you know, a few years time. Awesome. Chris, um, changing directions a little bit. Uh, what, what advice would you give now, you know, somebody that's just now, just getting into this business or wanting to get into the syndication business? Maybe they've flipped a couple of homes or have a couple of single family rentals, but now they say, okay, I want to scale this and, and do what you're doing. What, what do you tell them? So I think the important factors that people need to realize is you need, it's really tough to do the syndication business without having some money already in your pocket, right? There's a lot of things people don't realize, especially if you're going to do out of state, you know, there's travel costs, you know, there's costs to get inspections done. There's deposits, right? This money has to come from somewhere. Now, obviously you can go borrow it or have partners and this, that, and the other. The other thing too is people, you know, hear non-recourse loan and they think, oh, I don't need to have, you know, millions of dollars in the bank. You still do have to have certain qualifications to be able to get you know, a three, five, ten million dollar loan, even though it's non-recourse, which some people don't realize, but it's more of a common fact now. I feel like, especially in the syndication, bigger pockets, real estate investing world, more people are starting to realize that. You know, so I think a lot of that stuff people don't realize until they start digging deeper and dot, you know, diving into it a little bit more. That you know, the the world where you put no money down and you buy a fifty unit and you can kind of get seller financing for 95% of it and borrow the other 5% from family and friends. I don't know that it really exists anymore. There's too much interconnectivity and too many people that know what's going on now. And a lot of those deals have sold and it's a lot tougher to find long-term owners that don't know what they're doing anymore, especially in some of the, you know, the bigger metros, you know, with a million plus people and you're talking a hundred units plus you go out and find a 10 unit. That's a different story, but you know, those kind of deals don't exist. So I think, knowing that you're going to need money up front and that there's a very real chance you could lose money uh, is something that a lot of people need to know on the back of our 82 unit. We tried to do another 86 unit in Jacksonville and we were about, I mean, this was another one I was doing by myself on the side with a partner. Um, we ended up walking after we went hard because they wouldn't release the lease agreements. So we couldn't see if they were qualified or not for their credit scores. So we just decided to walk. So, you know, I've made, whatever I made from that 82 unit on a fee, I lost on the next deal. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't talk about either is the deals you lose on. And, you know, just because, you know, people see the, you know, one to two or 3% acquisition fee on a deal. And they're like, Oh, this is great. I do a $10 million deal or a $5 million deal. I can be making six figures tomorrow. A lot of that money, one, you're probably going to co-invest because that's what investors want to see. And two, it's going to go to this, that, and the other. And it's, you know, not really making that you're reinvesting it into other things. So yeah, maybe you are making it, but you're probably going to lose a good chunk of it trying to do another deal or, or marketing or traveling or this, that, and the other. So I think it's the money factors. 
people tend to underestimate going into it. So we won't have time to go into every detail, but that other deal that you walked away from, tell us mm -hmm. what, what was it that was so important, um, you know, that, that it made it so it was worth walking away from? It was the, the risk factor. So it was, it was a solid, you know, double. It wasn't a, you know, a triple a home run or anything like that on paper. You know, it was just another solid deal in a market we liked. You know, it had some good upside. The price per door was pretty good. And, you know, as we were going through it, you know, we kept requesting leases, kept requesting leases. The, when we did the physical file audit on site, they only had like 15% of the leases on paper. And we were like, you know, we got to the, the deadline for, we didn't have money hard day one. We got to the end of due diligence and we said, you know, we'll take the gamble that we'll let our money go hard. You know, we think we'll get the leases or we think it'll be all right. And it just came and then eventually said, yeah, we're not, we're not giving them to you. We don't have to. And, you know, it was at that point where we didn't want to go down the road of, you know, going for a lawsuit or anything like that. It was just going to eat up more money. We just said, it's too risky from the standpoint of if this guy's just put heads on beds and these guys aren't credit worthy that, you know, we could be 50% occupied in six months. Cause this was a guy bought it vacant about two years ago and, you know, fixed a lot of things and then leased it up. So there's a very real potential that he had put in non credit worthy tenants. And we won, if it was my own money, if I had $2 million, I probably would have done it. But it's another thing taking other people's money and putting into it. I was willing to risk that myself, but there's other people who aren't. And because I didn't feel that the reward outweighed the risk, especially with other people's money, you know, we ultimately just made the decision to walk away from it. What's the number one thing that's contributed to your success? Patience. I think just being willing to look at a deal and even though I really like it early or I really want it, or I think it'll be a good deal, but maybe it doesn't make sense on paper or it doesn't quite fit the business plan, or maybe it's a little bit of a stretch for where we're at in our business, you know, in terms of an equity raise or this, that, and the other, you know, just having the patience to step away from it or not do it, or, you know, just kind of be okay that, you know, it'll be there in the future or, you know, I'm not planning for a year from now, I'm planning for five years or 10 years. So, I think that's been a big factor in where I was to where I'm today. What's, what's some way you've recently improved your business that we can all apply to our business? The biggest one has probably been a refocusing of our investment criteria. We were kind of just buying any deal that kind of caught our fancy in the Southeast and Midwest. Now we only buy in nine markets in the Midwest and in Florida, and we're only targeting between, 50 and 300 units that have some sort of story or interesting component to them. So I think that refocus is going to help us weed out a lot of the crap that, you know, maybe we see a deal from, you know, Memphis, Tennessee in our inbox, which is a, a market we're not looking at, but we're like, uh, let me spend five minutes on it. And then the five minutes turns into the 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden, you know, I've got three of those and now I've wasted half an hour. So I think kind of refocusing on specific things is going to save little increments of time that are going to add up over two to three to five years. For sure. Chris, you've been a, you've been a fabulous guest. I appreciate your time and you being on the show. Would you tell the listeners how they can learn more about you and, and get in touch with you? Yeah. Two best ways, email. It's a uh, Chris at Toro rep.com C H R I S at T O R O R E P.com. Or I'm also pretty big on Instagram. It's Grenzig C R E G R E N Z I G C R E. Great. Well, thanks again, Chris. I hope the listeners will connect with you and I hope the listeners will go to lifebridgecapital.com and, and connect with me and go and you can schedule a call and I can, I'll help you any way I can. Hope you'll go to the Facebook group so we can all uh, learn from experts like Chris and we can all grow our business together. Thanks again. And we will talk to the listeners tomorrow. Yep. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.